Well, welcome. This is another meeting for the Amherst Security Group. And tonight we're online and um, we have a special guest with us, uh, Mark French. He's uh, been with us before. Um, Mark, I think it was it was the last time in person or was it also a virtual? Uh, Ooh, I don't remember. It was probably pre-COVID, Robert. I, that's I, what I'm thinking as well. So that's what I'm thinking. Likely well. in person? I think so. I think it was in person. So yeah. Thank you again uh, for uh, joining us again to to talk about a very interesting topic. And uh, Mark, I'll let you introduce yourself uh, and the topic here tonight. But thank you again. Sure. Can everybody see the screen, Robert? I just want to double yes. check. All right. Awesome. So, hey, folks, um, Mark French. I run a consultancy here in Starbridge, so not too far away. Uh, a little background about me. I, you know, been around a long time. You can see great COVID beard thing going, never shaved it. Um, started my career as an engineer. You know, I graduated from Western New England out in Springfield, you know, did my internship at Mass Mutual in individual financial as a COBOL programmer before I got my first job working at Electric Boat down in Connecticut. And then um, kind of stayed on the engineering path for a while. And then somewhere in there, like most of us, fell into a security role. You know, at the time, I think I was uh, running product management for Iron Mountain. And someone said, hey, we should probably have an AppSec thing. You want to build an AppSec team? I'm like, all right. So we built first AppSec team there while I was running Iron Mountain Federal. And then I just ended up being a security guy. I've been a chief information security officer for a bunch of companies. Uh, did a stint in the Valley running security for EMC, and then um, worked at a bunch of different companies, Mimecast, Endurance. Uh, last gig I had before I started this consultancy that we're running is is uh, SVP and Chief Trust Officer at Mimecast. Some of you guys probably have used their email protection product. Left there in 19 to start PSG here in Sturbridge. You know, I've got some, I got about a dozen folks spread out all over the world. Um, and really when Robert and I chatted about a topic, you know, one of the interesting things that we see is most of our clients, we, we generally work with private equity firms. So we see a lot of firms every year in that I'll call it 25 million to a billion dollar range in revenue every year. And we look at all kinds of stuff from AppSec programs to the topic we're going to talk about today, incident response. And all of them pretty much are consistent. So when Robert and I were chatting about, hey, what do we want to talk about? You know, the IR thing came up because our experience has been that most organizations have some semblance of an incident response plan because they're for, uh, let's be honest with you, you're forced to. You get cyber insurance. One of the questions on the questionnaire says, hey, do you have a cyber, <laughs> uh, cyber incident response plan? So somebody has one. Surprisingly, they all seem to be the same because they all went to the web and grabbed the, grabbed the same one and cut and pasted it and changed the names to protect the innocent. And then that becomes their incident response plan. And what we find in pretty much almost all the cases is lack of detail generally in the technical response. And that's not what we're really going to cover today because you guys have probably heard this ad nauseum over out on my air presentations but the other area that we generally see is all of the non-technical responses. So what we're going to cover today is kind of all of those non-technical things with a technical slant. So these are the things that we want with a takeaway for you guys as we talk about what we want to learn through at the end of this is these are just areas that you need to be mindful of. There's other people other than us in that technology team that we need to bring on board. Sometimes organizations do, sometimes they don't, but we, I just want to, you know, emphasize this is areas that you need to focus in on and also just things you need to be thinking about as you work through your incident response plan. So that's kind of the tee up for this. So let's see, let me get down here and nav. So uh, here, we're going to go through the typical model. We'll cover that just really quick because everybody's probably seen this. And then I want to really talk about the four functional areas that are complementary to our general technical response and the areas in which we overlap, where we need to pay attention as we do our response, 
as technologists to make sure that we're actually doing the things that we need to do to support these other organizations. So intro is typical. We'll, we'll quickly do that. Third parties, legal, marketing, finance, and then we'll just, we'll end with a couple of takeaways at the end for folks to leave with. So this is me. We talked about me. We don't need to do that. So this model, I bet you a lot of folks have seen. It's like kind of the NISTI model that they've put out where we talk about your typical technical response for an organization. You know, it starts with identification. Hey, something bad went wrong. We think we know what it is. We quickly move to containment to stop the bad stuff moving in the environment. Then once we stop the bad stuff, maybe moving laterally or traversing, we do the eradication. So we get rid of the stuff. Then we try to recover the environment. And then we do the, our typical lessons learned. So this uh, we are not covering any of these today because folks have probably seen this. And if you have an incident response plan, you probably have this diagram and you're likely have at least a section for this in your in the document that you have. So we're not going to cover these. What we are going to cover is these four areas that a lot, what we see when we look at documents as we're, if we come in to do assessments for private equity due diligence or for your capitalization event, meaning that you're, you know, going to try to go on to NASDAQ to be publicly traded, or you're getting ready to do, you know, like your first SOC 2 assessment and we come in as a readiness. The four areas that we generally see gaps in coverage of an incident response plan have to do with these four areas. So the marketing department, you know, like marketing, and we'll cover in detail for each one of these, but marketing, we see it in the finance team. We see it in the legal team. That one probably is the one most people have some experience with, but we're going to introduce some topics that you may not be aware of. And then third parties and third parties is a pretty broad definition. And you'll see that as we cover it. So the takeaway for here is it's not just about the technical response. There's a whole other group of folks that we need to be mindful of as we do and as an incident progresses through that circle. And they all kind of feather in. The reason there's no lines is they all feather in at different points. And it would just be a busy chart if I drew a line for each one where they generally come in. But these are the four areas that we're going to cover tonight. So. Let's start with third parties. And I, well, I'm going to introduce this term of typical response. You know, as you know, not every incident's different, but generally they're the same 80%. There's always a 20% drift. So we're going to talk about typical. There's always edge cases that will require different interactions in the organization or different interactions with other folks. But for today, just think of your run-of-the-mill thing that may happen. Maybe big, maybe small, but we're going to just say the typical response is, is kind of what we're going to cover. So as we look at third parties in an organization, this is a pretty broad functional area. The normal first party, the excuse me, the typical first third party that you would deal with is your insurance provider. So pretty much everybody on this line in some form or fashion, probably has a cyber insurance policy. And within that policy, there's a list of providers to help you in case things go sideways. Usually the first call that's made is there's some number on the carrier where you call and they provide you a 24 by seven contact. That generally is a breach counsel. So there's an incident response legal expert on the other side that's gonna pick that phone up or call you back right after that and talk to you about the incident and work with you to decide in the engagement of resources to bring to bear to get you back to where you need to be. So your first interaction is usually through your insurance carrier to breach counsel. Well, I'll tell you my experience, because I've done a lot of incidents in past lives, these folks are pretty sharp. This is all they do every day. And I guess the you know, guidance I would give you is do not forego this call. This is probably one of the most important calls you can do. So you probably, you may have inside expertise, you may have inside counsel, and you'll see later when we talk about some of the legal things, this is one of the most important calls that you can make because this person lives and breathes incident response all day, every day, 365 days a year. You want this person to help you. No matter how many incidents that you do, you know how big or small your organization is, this person is going to have seen more than you have from a legal and insurance perspective. So 
to make this call. Your incident response plan should articulate how and when you pull the call trigger for this. Normally, most carriers require that you do this call within a very specified period of time. There's no harm, no foul. So if you think you have a breach and your carrier says that you must call in 48 hours in order to guarantee coverage, call. If it ends up not being an incident, you're good. Like the carrier will just say, thank you for letting us know and move on. The one mistake that we see often with folks that are in the middle of a response is they forget to do this. And depending on the carrier, what can happen is, is they may choose to deny coverage because you did not notify in a timely fashion. So any incident response plan that you have needs to make sure that you have an SOP or standard operating procedure for that contact. A sub element of this person is what we call the payment facilitator. And we'll cover this a little bit later in the finance department, but this is the person that pays the ransom. You do not pay ransoms. And there's a whole bunch of reasons why, and we'll cover that in the finance section. You, there are people that do this for a living. You need to make sure that you use these people. And you use these people through your outside counsel. And we'll talk a little bit more about that on the legal slide. Because, you know, there are a whole bunch of trips that can happen if you just, you know, go down to the Bitcoin machine and decide that you're going to actually grab some Bitcoin and then give them the wallet address and hope that they give you the decodes on a ransomware. So payment facilitator tends to be a down uh, a subset of breach counsel, and we'll cover that when we do finance and legal. The next person from the provider is usually there's a, a set of standard forensic experts. The interesting thing that we've seen with forensic experts, and they tend to be the big names, you know, it's CrowdStrike, it's Mandiant, it's all of the folks that you would normally see. But a lot of organizations like to have Boutique folks. I mean, we, in my past lives, I've used folks in downtown Boston that are not Mandiant and CrowdStrike. The thing to know about these is there's no reason you can't use your boutique firm. Just recognize that the, the way this works, it, our experience has been, you know, they have a set rate with CrowdStrike. Let's just call it 500 bucks an hour. You can use whoever you want. And they'll likely pay up to $500 an hour. So if your buddy's IR firm charges $700, the insurance company will lay down the first $500 and you'll be on the hook for the other $200. So just, just recognize that. Um, the other interesting thing about the forensic experts, and this is why breach counsel is important, is they have a direct line. So they've created this relationship. So by getting the breach counsel, they have a separate number that you don't get if you go to you know, Mandiant's website and say, you know, 1-800-DIAL-FOR-HELP. You know, somebody will get back to you eventually and you may sit somewhere in the line. If you go through the breach council, they have a more direct line. So you will get forensic support much faster going through the breach council than if you like pick up the phone and dial 1-800-HELP. Lastly, and we'll cover this in marketing, you know, if this becomes a crisis and we'll talk about what a crisis is uh, on another slide, you are going to need somebody who does this for a living. Your marketing department, no matter how sophisticated they are, generally likely does not have a crisis communications infrastructure. You know, you might have a public relations person. If you're a public company, you might have an investor relations person. You need somebody who does this for a living because we've all been on the downside or the flip side of, of bad IR messages, right? Like you've seen, we care for our customers and et cetera, et cetera. Right? And we've all pandered, you know, people are pandering to us, telling us this at the end of the day, you need a firm that's actually going to have good messaging. We've all experienced this. The one that we're likely the most familiar with is cloud providers. So most of us are likely running in Azure, AWS, GCP. You need to know how to engage your cloud providers and incident response. A lot of folks, and it's it's not cheap, and I get it. You know, if you buy an AWS contract, you might only have support via their customer support organization. There are ways to find out how to call the security team. You need to figure out how to do that because figuring it out while it's happening is an unhappy place for you. It's also unhappy if they call you telling you there's something going wrong in your environment. So you need to create some semblance of a relationship with your cloud production providers. 
Because if not, you're floundering a little bit in that containment phase early on and you're going to struggle. The other thing to think about as, you, as you're rolling forward is depending on your contract with these cloud providers, engaging them in your tabletop exercise can, can be helpful. So for me, you know, I have a small team. I've got business professional for Microsoft, likely not going to get some Microsoft to participate in my tabletop exercise. But if I'm mass mutual, they're participating in my um, tabletop exercise, guaranteed my expense level. So if you are a reasonably sized customer with these folks, avail yourself of the opportunity to bring them into your tabletop to make sure that they understand and you know understand how to interact with these folks so that when something happens, you've got more of a direct line and you're not submitting a ticket and hoping that somebody calls you back in your four-hour SLA. The second piece of this that we find often is folks focus too much on their Azure and AWS providers and forget about all the other periphery business systems providers that are gonna be required to support this environment. Because if you've got an active adversary in the environment, they might start in your AWS account and then pivot over to your NetSuite account. And then all of a sudden, you know, your financial systems are offline and you gotta make a ransomware payment. So we see many of the incident response plans um, for you basically leave out all of those critical business systems responses so that, you know, if that adversary has the opportunity to pivot into those environments, those go down and their whole plan collapses on top of them. Like it was rock solid for AWS, but all the infrastructure that's going to be needed to say, pay that ransomware it disappeared. And now the clock ticks over and you're in trouble. So we say often forgotten, I highlighted it because I'll tell you like 95% of the time, it's not in there. And you'll look at that IR plan and it'll talk about some of these systems. Like I need JIRA up and I, because, or I need Slack up. And you haven't thought through what happens when those tip because of something, maybe the adversaries in the environment. Now, what do you do? And your whole plan starts to crumble and you lose valuable time. So I, I, I call this out because we see it time and time again. This is something that you all need to think about in your plan. The next, you know, squirrely one, and, you know, there's pros and cons of this, right? Everybody's got an opinion. You may have an interaction with law enforcement. And generally, there are, there are three ways that we see interactions with this third party. And here's where, again, we'll cover this in the legal slide too. You know, tread lightly would be my recommendation. You know, the first way is what I would generally call assisting, meaning that law enforcement has, has asked you to assist in an active ongoing investigation. Uh, it could, uh, of varying levels, it could be a crime, could be a national security thing. We'll cover this in a second. Um, you know, be mindful of how that interaction happens. You know, there are some things that your legal team, and this is where breach counsel is going to be helpful, are going to require, especially when it talks about collecting and enforcing, you need real legal remedy for this. So like you shouldn't be really doing these things without a subpoena or a warrant, um, really, because it just, it, you know, you want to be helpful. Most of us want to be helpful, especially if it's, you know, a CSAM, which is child sexual exploitable material, or it's a national security thing, but you do need to protect the company. So that interface with that third party, you should agree upon what that interface looks like before the FBI comes knocking on the front door, because that's not the time to figure out how you're going to interact with them. So we see this a lot and I, I'm but raise my hand. I worked in an organization thing happened to me and we scrambled around like, I, I, okay, there's five agents at the front door of our office in Boston. What do we do? So, you know, let them in the building and now what? So like the legal counsel was you know, picking his kid up from school and we're just scrambling around. I would tell you, this is something you need to be thinking about. The other thing to know is as you think about this part of your IR plan, know what agencies may contact you because there are some standard fare. So know, you know, go on to the FBI site and figure out 
sadly, every FBI agent now seems to have a LinkedIn profile. Find out who runs your cybercrime division in your area or where they're going to come from. The other thing to know is recognize what an ID looks like. So someone says, hi, I work for the FBI. Great. That is a great social engineering thing. But if you don't know what an official FBI ID looks like, I could just hand you a piece of paper. So things that you need to do to prep in case you get law enforcement contact. Here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, the reality of it is, is that the people that are likely going to reach out to you are the Bureau in Boston. Uh, for those folks in Connecticut over the line, it'll be the folks in Bridgeport or New Haven, excuse me. Um, the likelihood that the state police criminal investigation division comes out is pretty slim. Um, they generally usually support other law enforcement agencies and very seldom are you going to get a warrant from the guys in Maynard where the, the crime, the state police crime lab is. And even less likely as a commercial entity, are you going to get something from Springfield PD or Northampton PD? Uh, they just don't have the resources to do that. So, you know, know your FBI field office, know where they're going to come from and know who that is. Just so for folks here in Mass, Doug Doman is the head of the cyber unit in Boston. So, you know, if it's him, he's the guy that runs the squad there. And the reason I know that I used to be the president of InfraGuard Boston or InfraGuard Massachusetts. Um, so I'm pretty familiar with those guys. He's going to be the guy that's probably going to be knocking at your door. I call out national security letters. And, I'm, and I, I just, this is a side note. There are situations where a court called the FISA court will issue a national security letter, which they will show up, the FBI will show up, and they will provide you this letter. Things begin to shut down at this point because there's a whole bunch of things you can and can't do with a national security letter. Like you can't tell a person, like if you're a commercial entity and you're dealing with somebody else's data, you can't tell them that the FBI has got a warrant for their data. There are gag provisions there are a whole bunch of things that are spelled out in that national security letter for each council, for each council. This is a very squirrely part of law. And if you've never done it before, the time to learn is not when they're presenting the national security letter to you. So if you deal with infrastructure that has any national security connotations in it, and it's weird because it, you can be surprised at what that might be. Hey, here's an example, like the, the, um, the nuclear plant in Roe that's been you know, shut down. That could be a potential national security letter if someone was trying to break in and steal some of the um, machine code for some of the gear there. You wouldn't think that, but it may happen. So just recognize that these things exist. And if you're in a spot where you this may happen, you should brush yourself up on this and work with your outside counsel um, to understand this. This is a very unique set of law and unique you need a unique level of expertise to help you here. This is not your commercial attorney in your organization. You need to have somebody that's a specialist there. The other two things to think about third party, and this is probably our biggest section, so I want to be mindful, just recognize it. It won't be as long-winded in the other ones. The data protection authorities. So privacy is a thing now. It wasn't 10 years ago. It was starting to grow. Now it's much more relevant to us as technical professionals. As a result, more and more states are passing legislation, and that's especially true if you're an inter international organization dealing in Europe. These organizations have broad powers, um, especially in the European theater. So if you have European folks in European offices, they can just show up and they're, they're going to want to have a conversation with you. So recognize that that engagement needs to be choreographed as well as any one of the other third party engagements that you have, because those folks carry a 4% global turn if things go sideways, which is a lot of revenue off the top line. So you need to make sure that you account for those people showing up as well, because they will do a, a, a knock on the door. Same thing with the Federal Trade Commission. Again, kind of in the privacy space. You know, if you're not doing what you said you do, especially for those folks on the phone that deal with consumers because they're very focused on consumer-based uh, infrastructure, another person that could show up at your door demanding a bunch of stuff. So just recognize that these things can happen. 
our recommendation for organizations that think they cross any one of these boundaries is to create a very specific role in your IR process called a liaison officer role. Their job is to basically talk to the folks that show up in your organization. It's very specific. They have no other job but to do to interface with these orgs. Because the last thing you want to do is have random FBI agents just floating around your office as you're trying to do the IR process. You want somebody to handle them in the business, you know, work on the communications. This is in, in a large scale protracted incident. This is a rule that ab is an absolute must if you're going to interface with any of these folks outside the organization. So creating this role um, needs to be something that you need to consider inside your IR plan. Pause, deep breath. So I'm going to take a drink and then we're going to move on to the next one. Any questions from folks in the audience before we before we move forward? I'm going to say no. All right, so let's chat. Robert, do you have a question? Nope. Not a question, just observation. Just this is fantastic information. Some of this, I, you know, I've studied this before, obviously in the, my master's degree and all that kind of stuff, but though this goes even beyond that. So I really appreciate it. Thank you. So let's talk legal. This is the one that most tech folks are going to have the most interaction with in an incident, right? You've got a corporate counsel, maybe you've got the breach counsel. So the legal team has a few responsibilities. Generally speaking, we would say that they're the primary interface with breach counsel. I'm not a lawyer, don't profess to be a lawyer, but you need somebody that speaks law to law, and that usually is your internal counsel. If you don't have anybody in here, it's likely going to be your CISO or your head of security. Um, just recognize that we're not, most of us, I don't know, some folks may be, but most of us are not lawyers. So um, make sure that you're not trying to practice law in this case. You know, I know a bunch of law. I've worked with a lot of lawyers in my past, but I am not a lawyer. So just don't get yourself trapped in thinking you are sometimes. And we see folks do this. Uh, this is what breach counsel is for. Secondly, I would recommend that liaison officer be from the prior slide, be somebody in legal. So interfacing with other legal entities is best held by someone who's got a legal background. That's not always possible. I get it. Uh, just tread lightly because, you know, even though you're not the person under investigation, anything you say can and will be used against you. So you're not under arrest, but the reality of it is, is that if you slip up, if, for instance, we'll use an FTC thing, you know, you FTC person shows up, they say, hey, we're having some issues with consumers. There might have been a data leakage. And you say, oh, there's a breach. Ears go up because breach has a very specific meaning in these places. And you've just slipped. And now the whole dynamic of the interface of, of the exchange changes at this point. So our recommendation is, you know, that interface is a legal function if possible. And if not, have it be a segmented person off to the side that has a little bit of legal background, but don't give it to your engineer person. You know, if they've never interfaced with these people, it can, it's fraught with problems if you've never actually encountered these folks before and understand the vernacular and how they react to things that you say. Two other concepts as the incident unfolds is a concept of privilege. So for folks that may not understand the term, privilege is really a protection of communications in the event of litigation, which means that you create what they call an attorney-client privilege. So my interface with you through counsel is protected speech and is therefore not available to be used against me in case of litigation. So generally what we would recommend is that as an incident unfolds, one of the first things that we do is establish privileged communication amongst the IR response personnel. So that anything that we say, like saying breach when it's not really a breach, will not come back and haunt us in the event that we have litigation as a result of the breach going forward. This can be accomplished through the use of legal resources in the communication chain. So I know it's weird. So you're on Slack as an example, and you're trying to do the IR for this, right? And, and the team's really working hard and going back and forth. The best way to make sure you have privilege is make sure that whatever group you start has one of the attorneys on it and that you start that 
Slack channel for this particular incident with the first line being, this is privileged communication managed under this attorney. So now it kind of protects yourself against things that you say, maybe inadvertently from litigation through the process of the next line item, which is e-discovery. So recognize everything that you say during an incident is what they call discoverable, meaning that the attorney on the other side as part of litigation, because something's bad and they want to sue you, can subpoena all of those records. So when you think about your IR plan and process, they will subpoena everything in Slack. If, as an example, they will subpoena all of your notes. If you're using your personal cell phone to run the incident, they will subpoena that cell phone for all of the data and records. You will not have your phone anymore as part of that litigation. So just recognize, and you really can't say no. So recognize that all of that communication has the potential to be discoverable in litigation that may, have to the, may happen after the incident's over. So as you think about what your, what your communication channels are going to be in the throes of an incident, Recognize that at any point in time, all of that stuff may be required to be delivered to the council on the other side. So if your plan calls for you to use your personal cell phone and text messages back and forth, that may come under e-discovery and you may have to turn that phone over for you know forensic copying. And you may not have your phone for three weeks as they go through this process because the judge has ordered it up for e-discovery and you can't say no unless you want to be held in contempt of court. So as you design your program, design it around the fact that those channels may be subject to that e-discovery. And the way to help protect that a little bit is to have that privilege, because at that point in time, you can fight back to say, no, it was attorney-client privilege. You cannot have my phone. Where we see a lot of folks, and I mentioned it earlier with the FTC example, get tripped up in incident as they immediately go to the breach. And breach has a very defined process. So breach is really meaning that I've had an external theft of my information of some scale or size, depending on the industry in question. So if it's a P protected health information is 250 records, each vertical subject group of data is a little bit different. Don't say breach if you haven't confirmed it's left. So if you think it is and you say breach, a whole bunch of things can potentially happen. On the insurance side, they're going to want to know that declaration. Um, there's triggers on GDPR and the European Union on declaration. So our advice is the only person that can declare a breach in an organization is usually your general counsel, if that's possible, if you have one. If not, you let the breach counsel declare the breach. Do not use that vernacular in the chat channels. Do not use that vernacular in any written documentation unless it's under privilege and let the legal team declare the breach because the breach is a legal term, not necessarily a technical term. So let the legal folks actually declare. We see this a lot where, you know, in the heat of the moment, someone in Slack, you know, they're trying to do a little bit of that identification phase and they'll say, it looks like we had a breach. That's going to trigger a whole bunch of stuff. So you've got to train your teams as part of your tabletop to not use that language. It's not really in the vernacular and use something different other than that because it has a very specific meaning, which you as a standard sysadmin or systems security engineer really do not have the ability to declare that for the company. So just, you know, words of advice, make sure that that comes out and that you, you, you are clear in your IR plan, who can declare a breach and who can't. And that has to be kind of drawn out in that plan. Make sure the person knows you, everybody knows who does that. And when that trigger happens, a lot of times they don't know. And some random person will declare and then all hell will break loose, so to speak. So make sure that that's a clearly articulated part of your plan. Lastly, reporting. So at the end of this thing, or even in the throes of this thing, reports need to be written. We as technical response personnel will have lessons learned documents, we'll have incident reports. Legal is going to have another set of reports that are going to be supported by the documentation that you put together. So, you know, they'll have regulatory pieces, they will have shareholder things and their filings for a public company. 
what I would recommend to you is any documents that you produce, produce them in draft and let legal be the person that finally approves the final version of those things, especially if there's regulatory or shareholder uh, ramifications for your organization, because that way you can still make changes. If you give them the final document, it's kind of your word and going back, the optics of that look really bad. So here, what I would tell you is, you know, market draft, give it to your legal counsel, let them approve it or make changes and let them decide that this is the final version. Because again, that might be e-discoverable depending on how the, the incident unfolds. Then you want to make sure it positions you in the best light. It's not that you're lying, but I, I tell you, I've seen, I've been in court before in incidents and plaintiff attorneys will pick at things like your spelling and your punctuation. Like these things need to be buttoned up if we think that downstream there's any potential for a regulatory report or a shareholder report or a litigation thing. So don't finalize, let your legal team finalize for you. I Because I don't know about you guys, but my spelling's horrible. I can't type half the time and my punctuation is awful. At least that's what my wife tells me. So let them finalize it up and then do the submission. So questions on legal. This is the one that probably the folks are most familiar with. Nope. All right. So let's go to marketing. So the first question when folks think about why marketing, because I, you know, they do campaigns like and they run advertising. The reality is they they pay, play a critical role in any incident response plan. And it usually starts with crisis. So what's the difference between an incident and a crisis? So an incident is something that happens in the organization that has some impact. A crisis is incidents on steroids, meaning that it has an existential threat to the organization to basically have the organization have non-existence or have a catastrophic loss of revenue or something else. So in that situation, you know, the stakes are really high. Um, so this is a specialty, your average marketing person that does lead generation, or they're running your marketing campaigns on HubSpot. This is not the person. And even your average PR person that's writing your press releases, they write them for a commercial audience. They do not write them for every media outlet in the world. That's possibly going to happen, happen on you once you have an incident that occurs. So a couple of other areas in this case is there are other interfaces when a crisis happens. So we're in the middle of this technical thing and there's a whole bunch of other things that you don't think about that happen. So BCDR, so we hit the recovery piece. That's probably the one that folks think about as we went back through the loop and we got past um, kind of eradication, recovery is the next phase. What's our interface with BCDR? You know, can we bring that system back up and operational service our customers? Or are we are we losing a million dollars an hour in e-commerce traffic? Like so that 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 interface has to be tight because it's not just about potentially the security incident, it's also the, the systems outages that happen on the other side. So that tight coupling in a large-scale security incident where there's a significant impact to operations. They need to be coordinated together because while we may have got to the eradication phase and the incident is mildly over, we're still in the throes of the crisis because the website is still down as we're trying to run the backups back. So if we don't coordinate between the two, then you end up running into challenges. The one that a lot of folks don't think about is ESG, right? So this is the environmental social governance stuff. So as more and more organizations have programs around here, you start to run into we interesting, weird, maybe situations where you, you can run afoul of your ESG programs as a result of the incident in the middle of the crisis. So here's like one random off the, off the wall example. So you've got a whole kit of AWS gear running up. You spun it all up and you make carbon offsets. And you tout that as one of the things you do. And in order to recover, you have to spin up two other versions of it. So now you've tripled your carbon outputs and you've run afoul of your ESG. And oh, by the way, some of your biggest investors are investing through an ESG portfolio based on your carbon footprint. 
So now you got a crisis. You know, you've run afoul of this or your basic operation supports a social program, right? You support the YMCA. Right? They're one of your biggest customers. You know, that social aspect is going to suffer if you have a large data breach of all the kids in after school care of the Ys of Piner Valley, as an example. So you end up, you know, having other challenges, perception challenges or tactical challenges, like when we talk about sustainability, where ESG comes into play in organizations that have these programs. So these are things that you wouldn't think about in the throes of the crisis, but they are part of the crisis that's beyond legal implications and even beyond technical implications. The advice here is there are specialty firms, your insurance company will give them to you. Do not let your marketing folks think that they can do this. And we've all seen these things out there that's a result, all those bad responses from customer, uh, from these breaches, those generally are a result of them not engaging specialists in this firm. So similar to breach counsel, breach PR firms, this is all they do every day. You need to make sure that you use one of these folks if you're in, in a decent size instance. Now, like you lose a laptop, not interesting. You know, you lose all of the data for all of the Y kids in Pioneer Valley. You need to get one of these firms because that's going to be a problem. So you're in the throes of this, and here's where marketing plays. There's a concept called reputation management. You got folks have probably heard this. It's, you know, what do I do to make sure that the company looks in the best light possible? Hey, you know, we got a problem. We're working it through, but there's a reputation thing. Social media, you know, you stay off of it, but you need to monitor it because a lot of times you can get good intelligence sometimes from social media side. A lot of it's chaff, right? We can go into the TikTok, blah, 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 whatever. But the reality of it is, is social media is a good place for ground intelligence, not only for possible incident response, but also for customer sentiment, meaning are they pissed off at you and how much? So this needs to be accounted for. And usually in this case, um, The, the marketing team is the folks that run this. The other thing that we've seen is your adversary may contact you via social media. So if you're not paying attention, you may lose valuable time or insight because the adversary is trying to hit you up on um, Facebook and you're not paying attention. So it's important that any kind of response of any size where you're going to need to have some external communication, that social media monitoring is present in the organization and that that's tightly coupled with your intel inbound intelligence feeds into your tactical response management. Because if the adversary reaches out, the folks on the ground, as you guys are doing maybe eradication or containment, and they're saying something, you need that data. So you need to couple with that social media team to understand whether or not you're getting inbound intelligence that can help you through the phases of the technical response. The other thing that we see often is press interactions. So depending on the nature of the incident, you know, channel 22 is knocking on the door or they could, or one of the Boston channels or one of the Hartford channels could be knocking on the door outside the building. You need to account for that. What we generally see is, I know a lot of us do phishing simulations. We would recommend thinking about phishing simulations because this is how we see a lot of data leaking the organization. So we do a good job of, you know, monitoring email outbound and even social media but, you know, channel 22 or channel 40 calls up Sally at the help desk and says, hey, I'm a customer A, B, and C, what's going on? And they give them a lot more information. And we see a lot of organizations, you know, really don't do that vishing part. I would suggest to you, at least where there's inbound calls, you should be thinking about doing vishing training in this space so that you don't end up leaking information early, often, or incorrectly, because all of that stuff can be used against you, whether it's going to be used against you in the court of law or in the court of public opinion, it will come out if the people say it. And we see a lot of organizations stop at that mandatory phishing training, because every cyber insurance policy says, do you do annual phishing training? So everybody does, and everybody's got a tool to do it. Um, but they don't do the phishing stuff. It's important if you think you're going to have that and you've got a lot of call center people that this testing happens as well. 
The last area from marketing is security researchers. So in organizations that have the resources that have a dedicated application security team, they may have a product security incident response process for dealing with researchers. Many organizations don't. So what can happen in a technical breach is you'll get, sometimes you'll get a white hat researchers that will help you in the response by giving you some more technical data. So you need to understand that those people, you need to watch for those people coming inbound. So if you have a, a vulnerability at company.com or researcher at company.com, you need to monitor that chain as much as you're going to monitor social media because those researchers may have heard on a forum that they're in that something's going on and they saw your announcement through the PR firm and they're trying to help you. Or they could be validating the bug that's causing the problem or providing you additional telemetry. We often see folks that ship product in the throes of incidents forget to monitor those accounts and valuable intelligence is coming into those accounts that they learn about later. So if you are in a situation where you're shipping product, um, make sure that this mailbox, if you have a separate one or your security app mailbox is well monitored because you will, you have the potential to lose valuable intelligence by not paying attention to that and focusing in on really the task at hand. So we, we I call that out because 95% of folks don't have this in their IR process. Pause. Questions? All right, one more slide, I promise. So lastly, finance. So the first question people ask is, why is finance on this slide? And here's the reality. Everything that we do is money-based. So as we think about finance, finance is probably one of the most critical folks inside this that people forget about. And here's why. One is payments. So at some point in time, you need to make payments for stuff. Usually the first thing in a non-ransomware incident is what I'll call pre-authorization. So this means that how do I pay for um, sustained operations? So for folks that don't maybe know the term, Sustained operations is an incident that happens beyond a 24-hour clock window, meaning that I've got an incident at day's worth, and it's beyond the capabilities of a human being staying awake to manage the incident at one period of time. So you have sustained operations, meaning that I have to have transfer of command from one incident commander to another. I need to have the ability to hand off work to the next team that's coming in fresh. As part of that sustained operations, there's just life things that need to happen that you want to have pre-authorization for prior to the incident, whatever that dollar value is. So I need to order 50 pizzas in my office. I should not have to be waiting for a finance person X, Y, and Z to figure out whether I'm authorized to buy 50 pizzas. Or I've had teams on the ground that have been working 30 hours. I don't want them getting in their car and driving home. I want to get them an Uber to get home, or I want to put them up at the hotel across the street. You need to get all of that stuff pre-authorized with some dollar thresholds. So it takes a decision point and a communication point off the table when you're in this sustained operation that we're not having a conversation trying to get that finance person to authorize that you're just going to do it because you know, you've already pre-done this. So get that pre-authorization done for the incidentals to run the incident. And it's all the things you would expect, it's food, it's Ubers, it's lodging. Get that dollar figure so that you know, hey, I'm good for 10 grand of whatever I need to do to make it happen. And that's what's gonna happen. And anything above that, you can go back to refill the cup, but you know that that's one less thing you need to worry about as, as you're in the throes of eradication. Second one is interface with the external payment facilitator. This, as I mentioned early on, this is a thing. The insurance company should facilitate this, but finance is your primary interface to this facilitator. The reason for a facilitator is, you know, a lot of these ransomware folks, as an example, sit on um, the OFAC list, which is the Office of Foreign Control. I forgot the A, boys. I have a rough night tonight. 
really it's a list of persons that you're not supposed to deal and send money to terrorists, you know, folks like that. If you make a payment to those folks, even to get yourself back from ransomware, you're in big trouble. Um, you should have never sent that payment to that terrorist. These people do this for a living. You need to make sure that if you're in a situation where you've made a decision to pay, you actually go through somebody that knows how to pay. Like I said, you know, getting a wallet, fill a Bitcoin and transferring it over is a recipe for you to lose not only the Bitcoin, but not get the decryption key back. If you're in a situation where you need to do this, you need to make sure that finance understands how this process works, how to get money out of their primary account and convert it to a non-fiat currency in order to get that into the ransomware person. Um, so they need to be engaged and understand that process because otherwise you're scrambling around trying to call Bank of America in the middle of the night. Sorry, Robert, not to you. I know you're not there anymore. Um, calling Bank of America at night trying to get somebody on the phone to figure out how to transfer a million dollars out of your account into Bitcoin. You need to know how to do that ahead of time. You know, I'm not going to profess to say whether you should pay or not. That's an individual decision. But one of the hardest things that you're going to need to do, um, and you'll see this, and I, and I call this out because sometimes there's a kinetic aspect to a cyber response. You know, people can get hurt. One of the hardest decisions beyond deciding at the executive level whether you're going to pay the ransom is what you're going to pay. And we colloquially call this value of life. That's one of the hardest things I've ever had to do in my IR career is to sit down with an executive team and decide how much folks are worth. And I know it sounds awful, but it's something that needs to be done. How much are you willing to pay to do this? So it's a tough conversation. I would suggest that you facilitate it with folks that know how to do it. But if you're in a situation where your incident has a potential kinetic impact to living human beings, you need to have this conversation. That very frank conversation. You write it down, maybe, maybe not, but you all, everybody in the room needs to know because that has to happen before something happens. Somber there, Alec. It's somber for 7.30 at night. The next thing is contractor payment. So all of these mandants and everybody else need to get paid that you work on reimbursement. So you need to be able to figure out how to get a PO approved fast, done and dusted. So you need to practice that. If you've got a 12 stage process to get a PO approved and money to get cut, you need to figure out how you go from phone call to check in less than 10 hours. So the finance team needs to know how to do that because that's really what's going to happen. You know, if I'm going to have Mandiant parachute in, they're probably going to want an ACH payment quicker than not in many cases. So you need to make sure that the finance team understands how to go through short circuit, whatever processes you've built, still maintaining your Sarbanes-Oxley compliance, but you need to be able to have them move quickly because if it's a three-week process, you're in big trouble with these folks. So they need to understand how to make that go pretty fast. And then the last one that's often neglected here, and this is in combination with HR, is support services. So it's, this is especially true if your incident has kinetic. Mental health in incident response is a thing. Um, and I don't want to shortchange it, but support services for employees need to be there. You know, I have seen some awful things from an incident response process and the team needs support and finance needs to be aware that they need support and work with your people operations team to make sure that there's enough money post incident to support the employees that have gone through this incident. Um, so you need to have that conversation. It's sometimes it's finance, sometimes it's people ops. I kind of put it in finance just because they're going to ultimately have to pay for it. But this is often a, a neglected part of incident response, you know, we go to recovery and lessons learned, but we tend to think of that in a technical sense and not about the people that have just gone through this. So this needs to be called out in your IR process as part of the recovery and lessons learned part, because, you know, depending on the nature of the incident, it can be pretty traumatic. 
And you don't want your folks walking away from that and, and stewing on that. So make sure that that's accounted for inside your IR process. Next section is tracking. So here's the reality. In order to get reimbursement from your cyber insurance policy, you got to actually like keep track of your time because there's value to the time that you spent. So time tracking, a little difficult. Most of us live in a world where we're not hourly, we're on salary. But at the end of the day, there's value to the time that we spend. We need to track time, whether it's officially or unofficially. So there needs to be a mechanism to do this, especially through a sustained operations process. You've got to be able to articulate with some semblance of reality how much time you spent on this incident because it's going to be important for the organization to recover monies back as a result of the opportunity cost for you not working on your regular job. The other things to think about, especially, and this is true for large-scale incidents, where teams falter a little bit is, hey, I've been working for four, four weeks. So I was at the RSA breach. You know, we were there for weeks and you know, we got a handshake and a thing out the door that didn't sit well. So a lot of times, especially in sustained operations, um, team bonuses can be a good thing. And that can happen in many ways. It can be financial. It can be time off. Something needs to be accounted for for that. And that should be thought about prior to it. It shouldn't be an afterthought. It should be a forethought in anything, any plan that you put together. The other thing that happens when it comes to this tracking is demobilization. So a lot of times, you know, once we declare it's over, we forget that that lessons learned piece, that support services piece, that all counts towards your overall reimbursement to the organization. So a lot of times, you know, once you finish that recovery piece, you stop tracking time. And the reality is there's still activities in that demobilization effort that are happening. You know, you're picking up, cleaning up the conference room, you're doing your lessons learned document, all of that needs to be tracked as well. And a lot of work, a lot of organizations leave money on the table as a result of them not accounting for that demobilization activity and stopping too early in the reimbursement phase. And then lastly, services. So do not discount things that you need to bring back. So if I needed to buy X, Y, and Z to bring back to normal operations, all of that stuff needs to be accounted for. I needed supplemental contractors to bring your IAM infrastructure back. That's all part of that. Back to normal operations, it all needs to be tracked. So even though the website's up, if I can't provision a user because my Azure AD is compromised or, or down, and I got to stand a new one up and rebuild it, all that cost goes into that. A lot of times, you know, it's back to the blinky light going and they forget about all the other stuff to really return to a 100% state of normal operations. And then lastly, reimbursement. So they need to understand how to get the money that we just asked for back into the business. Because, you know, a large incident like that could cost millions of dollars. And for a small organization, that cash is just not lying around. Maybe they had to take out a loan. And then they're counting on insurance getting that money back. By following a lot of these things and that tracking, you're going to get your money back quicker, which is going to put less strain on free cash flow in the organization. Because even big companies with millions of dollars in a big incident, you know, you can drop 10 million pretty easily, 10, 20 million. Look at what happened with MGM, not to mention the payment. Their expense was probably out of the roof. I forget if they even said what that was. I think they talked a little bit about it. That's a lot of money, even for the casino. So you need to make sure that the finance team is on top of this and understands how to get their money back into the business because that money's the lifeblood of you guys surviving as an organization. Questions on finance. All right, last slide. Just wrap up real quick. Takeaways. So beyond the takeaways that we talked about throughout the presentation, a couple of a couple of things to leave with. About 90% of the plans that we see is probably a little north of this, only contain the technical response plans. All the other things we talked about are what we would expect in a plan. Because even though the technical response is spectacular. You guys are all good at it. You, you've drilled on it. If the other things aren't there, you can still fail in the IR. You could have the best technical response. And if you don't protect the privilege and you don't track your time, you're still out of business because you've burned all your cash on that technical response. Insurance is dragging their feet and then you're in trouble. And it's nothing you did with respect to the technical response we, we got messed up and all the other things that sit outside of that. Um, 
generally, I will tell you in a mid to large, in kind of that mid to large scale incident, you would think the technical response is the biggest part. I'll tell you that it's not. It may be the biggest expense, but it's not the biggest, in some cases, it's not the biggest amount of work. All of those other places represent likely considerably more work than your technical response. I know that sounds weird, but if you think about all of the other groups and all of the force forces that bring to bear, there's a lot of other people other than you doing the technical response that need to do activities in order to get back to normal state. Now, here's, here's where I dial it back a little bit. So your IR plan should represent all of these activities, but I urge caution. There's a lot of stuff in this document and Robert, I'm happy to share the doc with folks if they wanna take it away. But um, I'll call it, do not overclock the doc. You know, we have talked to folks about this and they want to create this incident response plan and it's 400 pages and no one reads it. You know, tailor this to your environment. What I would suggest to you is checklists. So even if you haven't necessarily fully baked all of these things, and I would recommend that you don't actually fully bake these things, only focus on the things that you're likely to have. Just having a moment of pause to see that it's a thing that we might need to think about, even if you dismiss it because we know it's not applicable to this incident, does give you the moment of pause. And if you find yourself you know, on this thing saying, hey, this has happened to me twice, fill in that doc now in that spot. But just so that checklist can be pretty streamlined, but just knowing that's a question that needs to be asked is half the battle. And then having the answer is the second half of the battle. But if you don't even know that you need to ask the question, you can get yourself in trouble really late in the IR process. And the last thing I'll leave you with is practice, practice, practice. So we generally, you know, most organizations run a tabletop each year. Seven times, eight times out of 10, it's a technical response tabletop. You need to test all of these other functions because they need to do stuff too. And if they're not practicing, it's great that your technical responses, but all the other stuff collapses down around you. So what we would normally say is if you've not done it as a consolidated tabletop, do two. Do one that's a technical one and do one that's the business one. As you get more maturity of practice, merge those together. But it's important that all the other functions do a tabletop as much as it is the technical folks doing the tabletop. Last little reference note, what we're seeing more and more often now um, is a lot of the IR plans are based on FEMA's uh, National Incident Management System. So they have created an all hazards incident response plan for all of the kind of emergency response disciplines. We see more and more of federal response falling that in line with that. So if you know you do a lot of work with the FBI, you do a lot of work with any of those federal agencies, there'll be an expectation that your plan is tailored to a NIMS-like model. It's actually a pretty solid model. So if you're looking to design one from ground up, go on to FEMA's website, it's all free. You can actually take the free courses for it. We're seeing more and more large organizations tailoring their IR plans and roles and responsibilities and everything on that NIMS model. So just a fun fact for folks that as they're looking to figure out how to build potentially a plan from ground up, not a bad resource to start with. And with that, I am done. Robert, over to you, my friend, if there's questions or. I don't have any specific questions just yet, but no, this is fantastic. And you're right. Mostly what I've seen is, is the technical side in, you know, some small organizations and even sometimes larger ones, but larger ones, I've also seen, um, you know, a little bit of talk about uh, some of the legal aspects and a few things, uh, and as well as um, media, I've seen that. But this is definitely a lot more comprehensive than some of the ones I've seen, for sure. So really appreciate it. Thank you. So, Robert, I'm happy to share the slides if you want me to mail them to you. I don't know if there's a vehicle to get them out to the staff, but I'm happy to give them to you if folks want to see them. It's really yeah, that'd be great. I'm going to stop okay. our recording.